Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Forthright's Ask the, Ex Ask the EUC Experts event. We've assembled a panel of end user computing experts from IGEL, Liquidware, Citrix, and of course, Forthright Technology Partners to answer your questions today. We want this event to be interactive, so please feel free at any time to use the raise hand icon or the chat box to ask questions. If we run out of time, we'll follow up with you after the webinar, or you can always email us at success at forthright.com. Thank you for being here. We know your time is valuable. And so everyone who is attending today will be receiving a free lunch, thanks to our sponsors. Um, we'll be sending you an email later today or tomorrow morning with the instructions on how to access your Grubhub credits. Um, we'll also be raffling off three Amazon Echo Dots courtesy of Citrix. And stay tuned at the end of the webinar, we have a special offer from Forthright. So let me please um, briefly introduce our panel. From Forth, the Forthright team, we have Matt McKinnon, um, Steve Zoberg, Robert Pate, and Alan Harlow. And then from Liquidware, we have Chris Walker, Chris Feeney from iGel, and Christian Watson from Citrix. So they're all going to be giving you a quick overview of their expertise and what they offer, starting with Chris from Liquidware. So basically, my name is Chris Walker. I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually the subject matter expert for Stratosphere for North America. So I do a lot with our, our partners at IGEL, um, uh, uh, Citrix, Forthright, around diagnosing platforms. Uh, Liquidware has a couple solutions, Stratosphere being our diagnostic and monitoring solution. So if there's a problem in your environment, you know, users disconnecting, having slow latency, or saying, as that I always say, it's Citrix. And by the way, it's not Citrix. It's your Wi-Fi at your house. I can figure that out with our Stratosphere solution. Profile Unity is also our persona management uh, and also have a flex app with our application layering technology. But I'm an engineer here to answer any questions. So uh, next presenter. Chris from Agile. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, Chris Feeney with Agile. I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I've, I've been in the end user computing uh, realm for about 20 years. I've uh, been with Agile for three years, uh, came here uh, you know, to kind of get going on the federal uh, business. Uh, after two years of building that, uh, came to work for the channel and support our partners like Forthright and helping them uh, learn and, and grow in their uh, agile knowledge and, and business. Um, some of my background is, uh, you know, from the security side, I started my career, you know, uh, in security with defense contracting, and that's kind of got me into the realm of IT and then I spent about 13 years at a healthcare company called Improvada uh, in technical services, uh, pre-sales, product management, and customer success. So a little bit about my background. I'm here to um, help answer some questions in regard to uh, what IJO can do for you. Okay, great. Christian. Hey, everyone. My name is Christian. I am a partner solutions engineer at Citrix. I previously before that was part of the Citrix consulting organization. So I've been on site with several customers working hands on with many partners to deploy, assess, design and deploy really Citrix solutions all over the United States. So uh, mainly focused around the ADC and networking pieces whenever I joined Citrix. But as many of you know, they attach well to the virtual apps and desktops and the workspace solutions. So got a broad knowledge and looking to help out where I can on the call. Great. Thank you. And Steve, do you want to talk about the fourth rate team? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to start by thanking all of you for joining us today. So today's spotlight, I can tell you, is going to be very, very informative. We got some great questions from everyone. I'm Steve Zoberg, COO at Forthright. For those of you who have joined but haven't worked with Forthright before, I'm going to give you a very quick two-minute intro to Forthright. It's very simple. We've been helping clients optimize their application delivery for literally decades. So we've been a Citrix partner since 1995, going all the way back to the Windows NT days those of you who uh, remember that. And our focus is on more than just tools and technology, right? It's about how do we supercharge your end user experiences. And over the last several years, we've built out our practice around being very user centric in everything we do. And what that means is that our passion is not centered around specific tools or products or even processes that might be optimal for us, but rather we put ourselves in your shoes. We pay very close attention to the experiences and the outcomes that affect your end user population based on the solution sets that you pick. So I'll tell you that it's no coincidence that many of the questions that you submitted and that we received for the session were related to user experience 
because of course it's a it's a hot button for most companies today. And Forthright offers six core services that focus on helping our clients deliver just that consistent and exceptional user experiences. So if you're interested in finding out more, please reach out to us, call our office, or send an email to success at forthright.com, and we would love to follow up with you. So let's talk about today. So today's spotlight conversation is all about you and your questions for our panel of EUC experts. And joining our experts from Liquidware, iGel, and Citrix are two forthright legends. Uh, I'm going to call that. <laughs> Alan Harrylau and Robert Pate combined have 26 years of experience working at Forthright and specifically on EUC projects, including a few that achieve global innovation awards. So there's no doubt that you have an amazing panel today uh, with tons of experience uh, to answer your questions. So now that we've set that stage, I'm going to hand this conversation back to Kristen. We're going to do a quick initial live survey and then kick off with Matt with some um, with uh, with the questions that you posed for us. Kristen? Yes. Okay. So we have basically the same question we're going to ask twice. So just give us your first priority and then your second. So like number one answer, number two answer. So first, here's the what is your number one priority for the next six to 12 months? So security, work from home solutions or transition, end user experience, productivity, or cost reduction and avoidance. And like I said, you'll get to do your number two answer next. Okay, lots of answers coming in. Give you guys a few more seconds. So far, security is winning out, followed by work from home solutions. We'll see if that stays the same. Okay, all right. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and throw it up on the screen so you guys can see. So security for number one priority looks like that's what that is. So let's see if we can get your second choice here. What besides whatever your number one is, what's your second priority for the next six to 12 months? Okay, lots of answers coming in. Thank you, everyone. It's fun to watch the percentages change. <laughs> okay, just a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll out and share. It looks like, once again, security is the first choice, but productivity and work from home solutions or the transition from work from home looks like to be the top three choices there, followed by end user experience. So, okay. All right, so um, now I'm going to let um, Matt from Forthright um, take over as we dive into your questions. Again, please feel free to use the raise hand icon or the chat box if you have any questions throughout the webinar. If we can't, again, if we can't get to them um, during this time, because it's a lot of questions and not a lot of time, we will follow up with you after. So, Matt. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so as Kristen mentioned, um, when you signed up on the registration link, you had the option to submit a question for um, this Ask the Experts event, and we have a lot of great questions um, thus far. Um, one question that we've had, geez, more than a couple of conversations um, with our customers with, what options do I have to improve soft phone audio quality in Citrix VDI? And this question really can be applied, it doesn't have to be Citrix VDI, any really VDI platform. Um, We've had a number of these conversations with our customers. And uh, Robert, Pate from Fourth, right, you want to kind of tackle that one initially? Sure, sure. I, and you're right, Matt. I mean, we get this question a lot. Um, and uh, not just for Citrix, uh, uh, kind of across the board, whether it's uh, Citrix, uh, Horizon, WVD. And we have a lot of customers that are basically have architected a solution that, that works great from a VDI perspective, but when it comes time to them uh, deploying a, uh, a soft phone solution, it, it's not, it, it may not be running up to par is what they expect. And, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of aspects to it. I think uh, from a, um, a high level standpoint, I mean, one of the first things we generally recommend is to make sure, depending on what the, the actual uh, solution is for your soft phone, whether it be Teams or, or uh, Skype or, or Jabber, WebEx, um, Zoom, whatever it may be, they all kind of have their own solution in terms of a plugin that basically where the media engine runs on the user device and, uh, and then it, it sort of a, a allows a solution where the traffic flows peer to peer. And uh, so, you know, leveraging that as far as the top of the list, I think is important in making sure that you know, you have devices that will support that um, in terms of solutions. So that way, the 
the processing can be redirected to the local machine. It'll run as though they were running it directly from their local, local machine rather than the VDI session. So we see that that works very well. Um, if that's not an option, because a lot of times we may have uh, endpoints that may not support the plugin option, um, you know, in terms of uh, Citrix, you know, uh, there is a lot of options to improve the performance, uh, even if the device itself won't uh, allow for redirection necessarily. Um, the HDX protocol is very well, uh, very good at handling that uh, just natively, but there are a few options you may want to look at, uh, uh, particularly the uh, RTP protocol, which is basically leveraging the audio channel outside of your HDX and allowing it to use it over uh, UDP. Uh, that would allow for a much more improved, especially when it comes to audio for your session. Uh, definitely also look into leveraging the EDT um, um, protocol as well. So that those two combined that will definitely improve your overall experience. Um, and then sort of like a, a, a last ditch effort, you know, if there is, if neither is really helping, a lot of times we've had run uh, leveraging the local app access uh, option as well, which uh, may also be a great solution for pretty much any uh, software that may not run well um, directly on the VDI side, uh, where we actually uh, deploy the soft phone on the actual local machine and it can be transparent to the user where they can launch a full VDI session, launch it within the VDI session, but to the user, it seems as though it's uh, it's in the session, but it runs uh, actually local on the machine and you don't have to worry about any issues in terms of latency. You know, I would add to that, Robert, um, obviously there's a lot of tricks to the trade on how to optimize the client and different ways of deploying it. You mentioned Teams and that is something that is becoming more and more popular of integrating voice over IP connectivity with direct, uh, you know, DIDs assigned to users and extensions with Teams. What's interesting about that is it doesn't matter necessarily what your current uh, telco solution is because you can you can run that in tandem. It doesn't need to be a rip and replace. And because Teams is heavily optimized by Microsoft to work in all these different VDI environments, there's nothing special that you need to do besides an optimization pack. And if you're already using Teams, this definitely is something that uh, you may want to look into. And if you have questions, obviously we can we can help you with that. We've seen a lot of success with that. We actually use that internally and it has, um, I think it's greatly improved our, our, our experience on voice over IP based calls. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the, uh, like Teams calls and things like that. The offload engines to the IGLs or the Citrixes in the world. Um, but some of the big issues I've been troubleshooting with customers is, you know, they do everything they can with the software they optimize the plugins, the IGL OSs, the everything, and the user goes home and he's got a, a Wi-Fi network that's just trash. So um, the the you know latency is one thing, 100 milliseconds, not 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 a big deal. But then when you talk about jitter, where that latency goes up from 100 to 150, down to 90, up and down, jitter is what kills your audio quality. So that uh, you know those users that are working from home and that uh, that latency may be high. But when the jitter and it's going up and down, that's what kills the audio. Yeah, I would just iterate that um, from Robert, Steve, and, and Chris's comments. We've definitely seen in the last year that the uh, type of endpoint uh, uh, that you're running has to have the horsepower if you can do that offloading. Um, and so, uh, working with uh, you know Chris and the Liquidware team, we actually have a nice assessment tool where you can kind of before you try to put IGEL. Uh, as an operating system on the device, you can see if would it handle the specs that are required, and those are specs that are detailed from Citrix, for example, uh, Teams, and, and you know, okay, they'll be able to handle this configuration or this workload, uh, but this, these these may not, and so we may need to be looking at a different type of hardware for that user. So those are nice, that's how the combined forces here uh, can help with that assessment before you try to send a user home. I, I would add one more thing. Um real quick, and this goes back to my initial intro that it's not always about technology. Headsets matter, they really do. Um, there's a lot of times that people are using built-in microphones and, and you know speakers, and then as they're typing, that comes through the phone call because they're not using proper headsets. And so if you're in an environment where you're really worried about audio quality, you don't even need to invest in an expensive pair of headsets, but relocating the microphone and uh, speaker local to the person speaking uh, versus you know off the local device definitely makes a big difference because I don't think that these devices were designed for high quality and many of us came from our office with HD phones 
And so we're used to having very high quality uh, telephone conversations. And now listen, we're all working remote and we're using this little tiny microphone on our laptop that uh, is not designed for it. So that's another factor to think about, just kind of thinking about the end user experience piece, uh, simple thing you can do to make a big improvement. So Steve, you're saying that my Amazon $20 special headset here is not a good idea? Uh, no, I, it's better than using the built-in. <laughs> I, mean, yep. I like the noise-canceling ones because I, I have a family and I got three kids and there's yep. always stuff going on around me and it's great, but you can't hear it. Um, but the truth is anything's better in most cases than what's built into your laptop. Uh, and it's good in a pinch, but obviously if you're using it for communication, you want to be crisp and clear and you want to avoid all the background noises. Um, and I think a lot of people miss that. I mean, I'm on with clients and they complain about it and I'm looking at what they're actually using and it makes sense. I've seen others have external microphones, you know, the cameras, if you're using an external camera, they have microphones too, but um, sometimes it's not even about optimization. It's about having the right tool. Yeah, here's an interesting use case around the cell phones. I've got customers that are call centers, and so before they actually hire somebody, they'll send them a, an ideal UD pocket, and they'll tell them, plug that into your com personal computer, let it run for 24 hours, we monitor it with Stratosphere for the latency, your network connection, Wi-Fi connection, all that stuff, and it's part of the interview process. If it doesn't pass that test, sorry, we can't hire you. And so they're actually doing that as a prerequisite because all everybody working from home, and now I can just you know ship them a, a UD pocket. It immediately checks in with Stratosphere, and I can tell what their home network is like without um, je um, jeopardizing any of their user data. Right? It's pretty cool. Yeah, great point, Matt. What's the next question? All right, next question. Chris probably um, ping you again here. What is the best way to handle a highly distributed workforce in a multi data center VDI environment with profiles? Um, don't. I oh, know, just kidding. Um, the, well, that's really, so I talk to customers about this all the time. I call it active, active, active data centers. So, what is, you know, what is the most important thing about a user profile, their persona? So, my registry settings, AT current user, um, my, documents, things like that. So I could be in an Amazon data center today, an Azure data center tomorrow, or maybe run in the Citrix in on-prem. So active, active data center, allowing that user to move from those different platforms with a common look and feel. I tell customers all the time, if we do our job right as IT people, the people right here on the screen, if we do our job right, our users do not know our name. If our users know our name, we're not doing our job right. So as far as persona management and the profile, moving that from uh, different technologies, Windows 10 to Windows Server, um, Citrix to Amazon to Azure, back and forth, Profile Unit is very good at that at active, active, active data centers. I'm not moving your apps. I'm moving the user persona and, and profile data around. So when I log in to Azure, all of my settings are there, my favorites, all that stuff stored in an uh, Azure blob. But I go into Citrix, I'm storing it locally on a, on a file share, then go over to Amazon, I'm on an S3 bucket. So Profile Unity allows me to do those active, active data centers for VDI um, very effectively, downtime, bursting, all of that. Is that. Did I get the base of the question there, or is there anybody see more? I, no, I, I, can add, I can add to that. I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, some customers may come in from a, a standpoint where they, uh, have more of a standard uh, profile solution and, and uh, they're, they're leveraging, um, you know, multiple data centers and they're looking at implementing active active because they want users to end up hitting both data centers. I think one of the big decision points uh, uh, initially is de determining on whether or not you should be implementing active active or active passive. You know, there's a lot of uh, variables that you got to consider in terms of going that route. Uh, I know that, you know, the, the two-way replication, if you're doing replication on the back end of your profiles, two-way replication is not necessarily supported by either Microsoft or Citrix or, or a lot of the other profile solutions. And uh, so you want to consider that when you sort of design on, on how you want the potential solution, or, you know, to look. Uh, are all going to be going to, uh, um, you know, alternating between two data centers or if you're going to actually split your user base, you know, maybe based on proximity as far as where they're going to, uh, uh, what is considered their home data center and what's their secondary data center. 
And when you kind of approach it that way, you know, you would want to split the profiles and cells and, and set up a one-way replication to their secondary sites. Um, you know, that's generally a solution that we sort of uh, uh, implement. Uh, that works out well um, because the moment you you just uh, try to use, uh, for example, DFS replication and uh, just open it wide open as far as users connecting to either side, you're just running up the risk as far as corruption to happen with their profiles. So, so we we want to you know one of the first questions we always ask is you know whether or not that is it necessary to have that active passive sort of scenario, or is there an actual need for the active active? Um, another thing I want to also add to that, you know, especially if you're using FS Logics, I would definitely look into uh, a feature as far as Cloud Cache. Um, you know, it's something that would sort of handle the replication for you from the uh, um, from the agent standpoint. So that way you can set up multiple repositories, whether they're on-prem or, or in the cloud, uh, and it'll sort of replicate to both those locations. So it's kind of sort of built already, so you don't have to handle back-end replication. Uh, we can definitely speak further into that, um, you know, uh, uh, beyond this call. Uh, and then another thing is, I think that a lot of uh, customers uh, we have discussions with is is how to treat profile data. A lot of times we do see um, customers putting in, the, you know, what we consider critical data like documents and, and desktop items into their profiles. I think that's uh, something that is definitely don't want to do. Um, you know, we, we try to treat profiles as expendable data. You know, it's important, but if they lose it, it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, settings and, and, and uh, you know, data like that. So just making sure that you're separating that data into another location for the user, whether it's home drives that are on-prem or even OneDrive, uh, having it redirect to that location. I think that's always important. Cool. Thanks, team. Um, next question, Chris Feeney from MyGel. We're going to send this one to you, see, and it's um, what are the security benefits of MyGel? Certainly. Um, so, for those that may not know much about MyGel, we're an operating system, uh, and what we're based on is a, basically a secure read-only Linux capability. Now, if you're moving your workspaces to the cloud, be it browser-based or desktop-based, whatever you still have to have an endpoint to get there and iGel is that endpoint operating system and so uh, built from the ground up with security in mind some of the things that we've done are you know modularize the operating system so when i say modular what i mean is that you know um, every part of the operating system you know is built on certain things called partitions and so that includes you know the citrix clients uh, liquidware integration, uh, various things like that that we kind of include in the operating system itself. And if you don't want to use any, any of the features that come, you can always turn those things off and it will not impact the regular uh, uh, piece of the, of the operating system itself. Um, there's, uh, we call it a, a secure chain of trust. So when the operating system is being booted up, um, earlier was talked about the UD pocket. Um, one of the nice things about that is it's, it's the operating system on a thumb drive, and it's uh, because it's we uh, got a signed certificate from Microsoft. We're a trusted operating system when it boots, and so we've had situations with ransomware attacks. Um, and I, by the way, I'm getting an echo in my ear. Sorry, um, but um, because the endpoint itself had been compromised, uh, customers were able to quickly switch to a UD Pocket, boot to it, and then still get to uh, data, whether it was a, a browser of like Microsoft 365 or their Citrix uh, desktop, while they uh, limited the you know the impact of uh, the virus being spread through the organization. And so that's a nice piece from a security perspective. Um, uh, there's also um, quite a bit, uh, like I said, you know, main thing being uh, centrally managed, uh, you know, we call it a single pane of glass. You can have an operating system that can not just run on, uh, IGEL has its own hardware, but we can run on almost X, any x86, 64-bit platform that is out there. We just need two gigs of RAM and uh, two gigs of disk space at a minimum. And, uh, and then from there, you can get quite a bit. And so, um, but uh, we've got quite a bit out there. I'll put some links into the chat regarding the security benefits itself. Um, like I said earlier, when I started here, I, I went into that federal world and, and we got scanned all the time and I never lost because we had some serious, severe vulnerabilities. Um, 
uh, it was it was rock solid. Uh, and if the purpose is to get you that cloud workspace, having that secure OS that is is uh, designed to prevent you know intrusion essentially, and only get that user to where they need to go. And then obviously some of the other things that we've talked about. Uh, once they are in that workspace, the user experience using headsets, using Teams or Zoom or whatever uh, comms platform uh, accessing their data, that type of thing. There's that's the other piece. There's no local data on the operating system at the endpoint. It's a read-only OS. You're not saving files and documents and any of that. If the if somebody were to take that UD Pocket, for example, and uh, try to get some stuff off it. There's nothing. There's no local data. Everything's in the data center. It's 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 not uh, like you're installing or saving files on it. So those are just at a very high level some things. There's quite a bit more we could talk through if you're interested. Thanks, Chris. Next question. Let's see. Well, this might be a combination back to you, Chris, and Citrix. We need a quick way to roll out end-user devices for Citrix VDI and Teams optimization support. What is recommended? Why don't we start with, uh, yeah, Chris, why don't you start with that one? Which Chris? Chris P. Yeah, um, so, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll put another link in there, but uh, what's really nice is uh, Citrix is a great uh, partner of ours, and uh, sometime last year, the Teams collaboration came out, and so um, that optimization piece. And so we actually have on our website, one of our uh, engineers put together and maintains a, an updated version of this, a UCC uh, Unified Comms Guide. And uh, just this week updated it because, you know, we'll get new versions of the Citrix Workspace app. It might have additional features, functionality um, regarding uh, Teams optimization settings. Uh, with IGEL, it's really just uh, everything for us is like a profile, so very similar to like a group policy setting. If you want to enable Citrix with Teams optimization, it's just, you know, you, you apply that setting to the device, and then when they connect into that Citrix environment, um, there's some uh, back-end things that you would need to do to get the Citrix and the Teams optimization piece, but once it recognizes that uh, you're coming from an endpoint that supports that, that offloading of video and audio would, would um, absolutely connect and you can see in your team session optimized for HDX type thing. So it's really nice. And that guide basically gives you everything you need to know on how to set that up from both the IGEL as well as on the Citrix back end. Gotcha. Christian from Citrix, did you want to kind of chime in there as well? Yeah, Chris brings up a good point. Um, so I think many of you will be familiar with the optimizations for Skype for Business, as it was formerly called, and now it's you know evolved to match the new product names as well. Um, it's some internal testing that we've actually been doing. I've personally been working on um, an engagement with um, some of our resources located in India, as they're about as far um, from me physically on the globe as you can possibly be. And so we've been working on optimizing teams. Um, like Chris was mentioning, the new updates are included with the Citrix Workspace app. So there's no special additional agents or anything extra that you have to install and configure. It's all included. And I would say just in general, uh, look for more changes and, and updates and improvements to the team's optimizations as we um, further validate for those more remote locations, locations that have very poor internet quality, or um, I think it was mentioned earlier, extremely high jitter. Those are the situations that we're exactly trying to optimize for is, you know, most of the the inside the um, United States communication is pretty robust. And so there's not really issues there, but when you're going, you know, 12 time zones away and you're looking at, you know, significant latency and significant um, input lag and delay there, having teams be optimized so that at, the, at the minimum, the voice and video quality is acceptable um, is really where we're looking to improve the product. So look for changes to that coming soon. Cool. Thank you. Let's see. Next question. As we transition from desktop to Internet of Things, what increasing security threats are now posed by a connected world? So that's a pretty could encompass a number of the answers, but a good question. Um, Alan from Forthright, you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. I could I could chime in on that one. Um, well, guys, look, as we all know, you know, IoT or the Internet of Things, you know, it, it's it's a fairly new concept, and depending on who you ask, which vendor you ask, you know, it started uh, 2008, 2009 to uh, 2010, around there, and because it is uh, such a, a new concept, a new idea, um, you know, there are several risk factors 
that um, I'm going to mention to you uh, that that make it um, a bit of a security concern, right? Um, and this is not in any particular order, but I will tell you uh, the the first one that I'm going to mention is uh, uh, high up on my list anyway, and that is the lack of compliance for IoT manufacturers, right? Um, uh, and we have new IoT manufacturers that come out every day creating new these new products, and th there's not a standard for them to follow. So um, we can we can see the security risks that come around uh, because of that. Um, uh, some others are, you know, the lack of uh, user knowledge and awareness, right? Anyone today could go onto Amazon or wherever, Best Buy, wherever you go to get your electronic products and, and pick up an IoT uh, doorbell, refrigerator, microwave, whatever the case may be, connected to, the, to, to their internet. And now, um, you know, they don't necessarily know how to harden it, how to patch it, how to upgrade it, whatever, uh, how to manage it. And so, you know, now they, um, they that's a huge risk to their environment and and to to if if it's being used in a business right um lack of physical hardening like i said you want to make sure that uh, you know these devices are secure they're uh in a place where they aren't uh easy, easily reachable if 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 possible um if there are any usb ports or anything on them you want to make sure that they're not easily uh accessible stuff like that um, again, lack of patching, lack of firmware updates. Um, believe it or not, some some manufacturers also, you know, they come on board, they join the IoT train, and realize that they can't keep up with the demand or whatever. And now they're out of business, they go out of business. So now we have these products that are out there that are no longer supported, right? Um, and as time goes on, uh, you know, new vulnerabilities come out for those devices. Um, again, just like with any other device, whether it be a, a, a router, a switch, um, uh, a server or anything like that, you have uh, an OS operating system, you have poor coding by developers, right? I can't tell you the amount of times that I've read articles where these developers continue to leave back doors uh, into these devices, meaning with uh, weak passwords, default passwords. And if any of you have ever heard about the Mirai malware, right? Um, this was malware where hackers were able to go into thousands of devices uh, using default passwords or weak passwords, right? And they were actually able to uh, create uh, a, uh, zombies out of these devices. That led to, the, to, to a, a huge denial of service attack on uh, companies like, um, I think it was Amazon, Netflix, Airbnb, Grubhub, so a lot of the, the, the these big well-known companies, right? They got uh, denial of service because of IoT devices. Um, I think that was back in 2016, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, the other thing is, a lot of these vendors, like I said, they're quick to market, right? They, they just want to get their products out there, so that leads to lack of testing, lack of proper testing, um, lack of securing the, their code, and so on. And um, you know, a lot of them use also insecure transfer protocols. A lot of these devices, uh, the whole concept behind it is that they are connected to the internet and they are transferring data, right? So um, if they're using outdated or unsupported uh, Bluetooth protocols or Zigbee or, or what have you, you know, that could cause a, a, a significant um, uh, security risk in, um, in, in these devices. And, you know, just like everything else, we want to we want to make sure that we are on top of patching our, our IoT devices. Management for IoT devices is a little bit tricky. There are a few open source, well, more than a few um, uh, vendors out there who have uh, applications that you can you can uh, manage your IoT devices in in a single pane of glass. So you want to look into that. You you know you you Google that on on um you search that on Google and you come up with a bunch of uh, vendors, open source vendors that are that are doing that now. Uh, I think that's a good way to keep on top of your your patching and so on. You know, I think the other thing that this uh, shows off or demonstrates when you talk about the challenges, uh, you can also add <clears throat> the end user um, error right by using poor passwords or even duplicating the passwords that you use on these IoT devices, thinking that they're safe. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a good um, use case or driver for you to be deploying single sign-on and 2FA on your authentication. 
uh, certainly on all your critical assets, because that way, even if somebody does get into one of these devices and maybe they capture passwords or they're, they're turning into a zombie device and they're, they're watching traffic on the internet, you now have another mechanism to provide protection for authentication. And then of course, single sign-on, when you have a solution like that, and you know, Citrix is, is one of those vendors that has a great solution for that in their workspace, it allows you not to worry about uh, remembering all these passwords. And that's, that's why people get lazy, is there's just too many passwords to remember, because they don't have a tool to kind of manage that for them. So um, to me, when I look at this, it's not a problem that we can actually solve uh, certainly easy, right? Because there's no standards yet and it, the development is, is evolving so fast. But if we can stay focused on what it's actually doing and making sure we protect the valuable assets uh, through these additional authentication me uh, methodologies, that's key, which I, I could say every environment at this point should have 2FA uh, at, at a minimum. I, 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 it amazes me how many environments I see that don't. Uh, and I am, uh, I, I don't know, I'm very, very surprised at that. Yeah, so just, just one thing to add from the Citrix side, this is something that IoT devices I've actually been working quite a bit with recently. As we unveiled um, Citrix Secure Internet Access back in February of this year, and a function of that, I guess uh, one of the common use cases or conversations around that has been around the, the lack of support for installing a local agent on those Internet of Things devices. And so because there's no way to, I guess, address this with the traditional methods or the traditional tools for securing endpoint devices. And like I think Steve and Alan both mentioned that they're kind of geared more towards um, end user consumption rather than enterprise level consumption. And so the user experience isn't designed with you know security at the forefront. It's designed to be fun and easy to use. And so with that in mind, securing the dead end flight is, is kind of the best approach at this point is there's not really a local agent that can secure those endpoint devices. And so that's where uh, I've worked with some customers on defining network tunnels for all of their Internet of Things devices so that it's going through a scrubbing service and basically preventing anything sensitive from um, being exfiltrated or uh, any attacks being exploited through those devices. So definitely uh, an evolving space for sure. Thanks, team. Great stuff. Another question we had, this is around FS Logics. What are recommended practices in migrating user profile de data in and out of FS Logics? I'm going to uh, let Robert Pete from Forthright um, start with that one. Robert, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, yeah, and, and so I, I think I'm going to read that as as uh, migrating into or out of FS Logics. Um, you know, I, I, we get this a lot. Um, either the the customer is looking to move into an FS Logic solution from their current profile solution that they have, or they may be moving on to a different uh, solution, um, you know, to and, and maybe, or maybe just leveraging a, a, a hybrid scenario where, you know, they want to leverage FS Logic's office containers, but the profile itself will be managed by, you know, a, a solution such as Profile Unity. Um, you know, we usually start off with just, uh, an exercise of determining exactly what is needed to migrate to begin with, uh, especially if they're coming from uh, one OS to a different type of OS. Uh, generally, you just don't want to blankly, you know, migrate everything you can it, because you're just kind of asking for issues to occur there um, due to conflicts. Uh, you know, I, I think that once you determine on exactly what needs to be migrated, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, you can basically supplement your uh, current environment with another uh, with another solution that you can put on top of uh, FS Logic. So, for example, if you're moving into FS Logics, you would have in your destination your current profile solution along with FS Logics, and, and FS Logics will eventually uh, retain that data, and then you can just cut off your your current solution or vice versa. Um, you know same scenario basically um you know i can let uh uh chris from uh, liquidware he can uh probably get he's been through a lot of those scenarios i know we've worked together on those you can speak a little bit more to it yeah it just depends on where i mean you got to do an analysis at the end of the day so fs logics on prem fs logics in the cloud <clears throat> where is it running and what are the requirements do i need to do multi uh, multi-session which changes you know the dynamics completely how do i run fs logics um, so I need to run Windows 10 as well as a Citrix, <coughs> a Citrix uh, you know, Zen app, uh, type application. I need multi-session. So really, you know, that's a that's a large question. Recommended best practices for migration of user profile data into and out of. 
Um, that is a huge question. And it depends a lot on your environment and the requirements of the user. If the user is a one-to-one -one relationship with one, you know, one machine, one user, that OS isn't going to change for a year. No big deal. But if he has multiple multiple um, sessions, uh, that is, I would recommend somebody call Robert Pate and tell him what you're trying to do before um, he, you know, said blanket, do it this way. You know, recommended best practices around FS Logic are out there. But they're all unique to your business. Uh, Profile Uni can help out a lot with that. But at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you a thousand questions. Tell me where you are today. Tell me where you're going to be in six months. And tell me about your high availability and active, active, active requirements two years from now. So I'm going to actually decline to answer that question and say, please call Robert Pate and have a conversation with him. To uh, um, We just don't want to throw an answer and say, oh, just do this. And then everybody goes and does it and calls um, Robert back. Or actually, you tell him to call Matt, and we'll let him yell at Matt. So ho sorry for the <laughs> – just trying oh, to be honest. With you. There's more than one answer to that question. Yeah. Thank you. Point, Chris. <laughs> and next question, let's see. I could speak to the replication question as well. And, you know, I, I would – I would always, in terms of replication for FS Logix, uh, you know, use Cloud Cache if possible. Uh, definitely a great feature to use. Um, if it's not an option, just uh, it, it goes back to my previous answer uh, uh, around the top of, of replication, you know, to make sure that you're not having a two-way replication set up, front end it with a, DF, a DFS namespace to kind of simplify as far as the, uh, uh, the setup in your uh, policies. Uh, but just ensure that you're not uh, uh, creating a scenario where, you know, there's rights going back and forth at the same time. Thanks, Robert. So this next question, I'm willing to bet the vast majority of people that attended this webinar have had numerous conversations about. And that is, what is the best way, how, how can we improve our Microsoft Teams performance on our VDI environment? Robert, I'm going to let you start with that. Uh, and, and I think we, we've all, we've kind of touched on on that um, so far. Uh, I you know I definitely would say use like we discussed before. Make sure to use the optimization um, uh, tool set from uh, Citrix if you're on Citrix um, or uh, any other solution that will allow the redirection of, of Teams uh, onto your uh, local client. Um, you know you want to make sure that you're using a uh, a VDI friendly version of Teams. Um, there's two different flavors of it and, and you're gonna wanna use the uh, machine install uh, version of that to, uh, uh, you know, otherwise you're gonna have a lot of issues, especially in reference to profiles on the way that Teams sort of loads on a per user basis. Um, and then also make sure that Teams is being cached appropriately. Um, you know, if, uh, again, that goes back to uh, using appropriate profile solution that will uh, redirect your cache rather than trying to retain it within the profile that may be loading back and forth with every every login. Um, but I'll defer to either uh, Citrix and or or uh, um, you know or um, IGEL as far as any additional uh, comments on I got, that. I got a comment. Um, and Steve actually made a comment about earlier about how efficient Teams was. Um, I'm going to argue that one big time. But Stratosphere tells me about teams. It spins up thousands of threads in the background. Um, it'll let it run for a couple minutes, trash them all, restart them all. Um, teams is, I mean, it's everybody's moving to it because it's free with Microsoft. Um, but there are multiple issues around that, especially in a VDI environment. Um, we have a technology called Optimizer. Um, and a lot of times when I turn on Optimizer in conjunction with Teams, because Teams is very sensitive to CPU latency. So if your machine is overloaded, it will dramatically affect your team's um, um, your team's capabilities of doing audio and video. So if you've got applications, whether it's a physical machine or a virtual machine, and that machine is overloaded, and you're getting audio feedback on Teams call or something like that, it it may not be the network. It may be the actual CPU itself is overloaded and can't process the data. Thereby, it looks like latency. I think Christian may have more. Uh, more information about you know optimization of teams, but at the end of the day, it's it's a complicated beast. Yeah, I definitely agree about the optimization piece for Teams. Um, I think Teams is about as CPU optimized as Chrome is for RAM optimization. They just that 
anything that they can get their hands on it's going to use so that's critical for us to keep in mind but it's fortunate that that's what we're working on and so as of windows 2009.6 and linux 2009 versions of the workspace app we've actually unveiled some uh i guess it's not headline news but it's some back-end tweaks and changes to the way things work for the team's optimization that significantly improved performance so if you're struggling with that looking for an option to test i would recommend going to that version or a later version since then as they have some some pretty significant changes in terms of performance yeah kristen uh, shared it in the uh, the wider chat, but there's an optimization guide. I referred to it earlier. Uh, we, we do maintain this uh, very frequently. It was just updated just this week uh, as we've gotten some new updates. So there's a whole chapter in there on Citrix, on iGel OS 11 with Teams, uh, how to optimize uh, for that. So this is basically our internal Bible that we share with the larger community. So if you're looking at that and you're testing, uh, certainly refer to that. It's got a lot of great stuff. Thanks, team. All right, another question I think would be applicable to a lot of people on the phone. All right, we're in the process of planning out a new refresh of PCs at our branches. How can we best ensure a consistent end user experience across all of our locations? So a few panelists can probably chime in on that one, but uh, Robert, perhaps you you know might want to start up start there. I'll just have a short note. Key is consistency, um, and and uh, you know we've had very well built uh, VDI uh, architectures that uh, the customers built, and and they sort of just uh, fail just because of the, they didn't look completely from end to end um, in in terms of the the entire solution, um, and where you know we. Uh, the endpoints are basically you know everything may be running great on on the server side, but on their endpoints are causing issues that may impact the user experience. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of uh, defer to iGel because I know that uh, their solution uh, will, will, is great for this. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, one of the benefits, um, you know, the, the key word I'm gonna target in on this uh, is, is that refresh uh, word or the refresh of PCs, right? So the status quo is I've got to replace my Windows laptops with Windows laptops in order to access my new VDI backend or, or whatever. IGEL's whole mantra is about disrupting the status quo in regards to end user computing. And so um, a lightweight OS that can be you know, installed on a variety of devices, refreshing those machines by just basically taking that, that older Windows OS and, uh, and then replacing it with a, uh, a more frequently updated lightweight Linux OS that can be completely optimized for the environment, um, you know, and have a consistent user experience, not just for, you know, uh, somebody in that particular branch, but also the administrators uh, also know they've got a common platform uh, that they, you know, can completely control. Uh, we've got customers and, and retail and others where, you know, the administrative costs of managing iGel have completely gone down because you can automate a lot of it. You can keep, um, you know, you don't have to have a ton of FTEs managing these devices. You can have one person, you know, with some automation, you know, a quarter of their time or even a half of their time, you know, staying on top of, of these devices. But, but that's really our key mantra. There's a lot of, uh, information out there on on our website regarding this but um but it is that to that polls that were done earlier right it's uh we've seen a lot lately about that end user experience being crucial as robert mentioned i've been in environments in healthcare and others where you know they're blaming something right and it's not always that back end it's it's something else going on and having other tools like liquidware to really help figure out where is the smoking gun um been on on conversations where they realized it was a profile issue something was taking way too long to load and the user experience was getting trashed and um and uh, having tools like that to identify it so i i think the other thing to consider um you know obviously when you're looking at vdi one of the big uh components of this is that you have all the back end processing right that it's happening in your data center or in the cloud and it's not the endpoint device so many clients feel like well i already have pcs we could just use them. We can install the client, we can connect via a web browser. Uh, and while all, the, all of that is true, if your endpoint device is unhealthy, 
uh, what is going to happen is it's going to impact your performance. Uh, and so obviously you can replace those devices, but you can also refresh them. Uh, and I think to Robert's point, keeping them consistent is really important. And then you add the whole bring your own device scenario where lots of people are working from home and you may not necessarily have the ability to just refresh and lock down a machine, uh, which again kind of goes back to Chris and the iGel to the fact that you can use like a UD Pocket, for example, and boot the older machine where now you have a clean OS managed by iGel and when they're done, you unplug it, reboot back into the end user environment, they can do whatever they want. And so uh, dealing with that endpoint, whether you're replacing it or whether you're putting in a different operating system so you know that there's some consistency there and you're not having your users connect where their machine is filled with bloatware or whatever issues are going on uh, it is a big part of that. If you think about when you buy a laptop, how fast it is when you first get it and then you fast forward a year or so and you're like, you know, I really remember this device being faster <laughs> than it is right now. And it's because just the nature of Windows and all of our surfing and our behavior of what's happening on those machines. So if you don't address that, um, your VDI session can still be very slow and perform, you know, in, in, uh, in a very adverse way. We've seen banks, for example, do, um, you know, branch location upgrades where there's an M&A that's occurring and they leave the PCs there because they can just connect and they don't use an iGel terminal or an iGel UD pocket and they don't format that machine and rebuild it from scratch and lock it down. They just literally just leave it because you can connect to your VDI session. That is acceptable when you're onboarding and you're starting that process where you have to still keep the old environment running. But when you're ready to cut over and you're not in that process where you're training users, if you want a good experience and you want it to be consistent, you have to make sure you've standardized and you've started over on that endpoint device. It's the only way, regardless of what path you take, you wanna make sure that it's clean and it's optimized. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I think we might have time for one more question. Uh, I wanna leave a few minutes for Kristen in the drawing at the end. Um, let's see. Is there anything new in Windows Virtual Desktop that do a better job of spinning up and shutting down VMs to save costs? Um, Robert, perhaps you should maybe start with that and maybe Christian chime in and um, kind of elaborate on what Citrix is doing there. Sure. Um, so as in terms of WBD, you know, they're, uh, it, I mean, this is uh, based off the, the native WBD solution. You know, there's a number of PowerShell scripts, um, one particularly sourced directly from Microsoft, um, you know, and as, as well as other third party options on GitHub, um, which can manage the power of, uh, for any particular pool that you may have. Um, some are, are, are scripted and based off the resources available. Others are based off uh, user counts. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that they're, they're, they're usable and they, and they work, though they're fairly basic and, and uh, may require a, a lot of upfront scripting in order to get them working the way that you, you want them to and, and make it efficient at saving your costs. Um, you know, in terms of uh, um, utilizing your WVD with, with Citrix, um, I know that can definitely help, um, you know, in terms of leveraging the auto scale feature, uh, which is a more, much more robust option, in my opinion. Uh, you can manage your workloads based off schedule or load base usage or both. Um, there's really no scripting or complexity, uh, uh, complexity uh, as a part of that. And uh, it even has a built-in um, cost calculator, you know, that'll show you the real world cost savings based off your, your initial settings. So that way you can adjust and see on how your savings are improving over time. Um, you know, I'll also to defer over to, to uh, uh, Christian from Citrix uh, to uh, add on to that. Yeah, you covered the, the highlights there. So um, I won't really reiterate the points, but basically the new update, the name Azure Virtual Desktops, that's new. And then along with that, we've updated the cost calculator tool to version two. And so we've added based on um, partner and customer feedback, some additional capabilities for calculating in more granular uh, detail what the cost savings will be. And then from personal experience, I've had several calls where the source of the call, the source of the conversation is dissatisfaction with power management, um, basically the scripts that Robert was referencing, in that it requires a lot of legwork on the front end to get them up and running and functional, whereas Citrix provides you know, a graphical interface that you know, makes everything just a click of a button. So 
there's been several um, situations I've seen in the past where that's been the gap for a customer and Citrix has actually won the deal because we offer just a, a graphical interface that makes that easy. So yeah, just adding some more there, but yeah, Robert pretty much covered the details. Thank you, Christian. Kristen, I'm gonna hand it over, pass it off back to you and let's give away some prizes. Okay, great, hold on, I'm gonna get one more slide. There we go, okay. So we have um, three Amazon Echo Dots courtesy of Citrix that we have to give away. And I did a um, drawing while you guys were answering questions. So the winners are, um, and I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name, Robert Kohler, Scott Strain, and Joe Roberts. So I will contact the three of you um, to get your Informa contact information so we can get your prizes to you. So congratulations and thank you to Citrix for that. Um, like I said, we will, um, everyone who is here today will get a free lunch. You'll get credits um, to use uh, with Grubhub and I will send you information about that. If you have any questions, you can email us at success at forthright.com and I can answer any of those questions, but you should see um, that email come through either today or tomorrow. Um, and then I mentioned we have a special offer from Forthright. We have a limited number of one-on-one uh, -on -one consultative appointments with a Forthright architect. If you're interested in this opportunity, please email us again at success at forthright.com and we'll schedule your appointment. These appointments are limited and are first come first serve. So please email this week um, if you are interested in this opportunity. Yeah, this is for, you know, if you wanted to dive deeper um, into any of the topics and questions we were discussing today, um, we're happy to have a conversation with you with one of our architects. Yes. Or and, any question that's not, that we may have not gotten to that you have for your environment. And we also, um, if you wanted to learn more about any of our sponsors, Liquidware, Citrix, and iGel, we can also set up a demo for you as well. Um, so without further ado, I would like to, I guess, thank you all for being here today, thank you to our sponsors, Igel, Chris, uh, Chris, and um, Liquidware, um, Citrix, Chris and Christian, and all our um, panelists. On behalf of the Forthright team, we thank you for joining us today. And like I said, you'll be hearing from us um, this afternoon or later this week about your lunch and prizes. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Have a great week.